Kari's absolutely fantastic new contribution to voice scholarship. Super fabulous, a systematic approach to voice. Welcome, Kari. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for the time it's taken you to read and prepare for today with everything else you've had going on. My pleasure. Um, so, Kari, just so that everybody, if, in case everybody doesn't um, know who you are, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, some things about yourself. <laughs> Um, I always think, boy, that's a dangerous question to ask a woman of my age. <laughs> um, but I think in, in context of this conversation, I was probably a, a typical young singer in my teen years, singing in choir, and I started studying voice at a young age. And I acknowledge, in fact, to those teachers in the acknowledgement of my book, because I think it's so important to acknowledge our teachers throughout our lives. And then I went off to a liberal arts school here in Seattle area, um, Pacific Lutheran, and then moved to Indiana, where I completed my bachelor's and master's degree. And in context specifically of this conversation, I remember taking a um, pedagogy course with Roy Samuelson, and we used Ralph Appleman's book. And bless his heart, I mean, what an incredible resource, but as a early 20-something singer with stars in my eyes, you know, it was just a course that I had to take. And when you go back and look at that book, right, very dry, filled with anatomy. Um, so I just was not interested in this that I now am so passionate about, which is I so ironic, you know, it's the great irony of my life, I think. Um, and then went off and started singing and, but all of that time I started, I was teaching. I talk about this in the preface of my book. I had a wonderful teacher early on, Barbara Polshock, who got me connected with the local high school. And I started teaching when I was 19, 20, long before I should have been teaching. <laughs> and I, uh, when I moved to Indiana, I immediately contacted the local high schools and had a full studio. So I literally have been teaching since I was 19, 20 years old. That's um, amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, again, long before I should have, and, and my roadmap back then was teaching what I was being taught. That was it, you're right, which is lovely. It wor was working for me, but not really, I always was seeking answers. And I remember sitting at Indiana University with students and we would sit around and talk about breath mechanics. We would have called it breath support back then. Sure. Um, and there was th this feeling that, if you were in this studio, you learned this way. And if you were in this studio, you learned this way. Um, anyway, so I, I went about teaching and singing and eventually went back and got my doctorate. But in between that, I came across Scott McCoy's book, which I talked quite a bit about in the preface. Yes. And I'm, you know, I'm so indebted to Scott because that book came into my life at the right time and really resonated with me. And I think because I didn't feel like I had to adhere to someone's methodology. It, mm. it didn't feel like it was about Scott McCoy. It felt like there were answers for me that I had been seeking in conversations, but was always getting different answers because it depended on somebody's approach or someone's interpretation. But here we had some facts about the principles and the mechanics of voice production. And so that just really resonated with me and, um, and shifted my teaching. So I don't really think I answered your question of a little bit about my background, but you, we'll, we'll you keep it on some context. great stuff. You're, you're, you're answering questions I haven't even asked yet, which is perfect. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. <laughs> no, you're great. Talk a little bit about, because I know we, we, we talked about this before we deal into dive into the nitty gritty of the book. Talk a little bit about the difference of, you know, sort of viewing all of this information, maybe, um, and our, how our community might come at information differently in terms of like the craft of teaching versus being a singer. To talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm trying to, I want to get clear on the craft of singing. Yeah, sorry, took me a second to connect dots. Yes, because you know, I know exactly what you're leading to a bit of my EBVP, I suspect. We're getting there, yes. Okay, but... sorry. I'm used to being the interviewer, Nick. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. <laughs> um, so 
Yes, I think the act of studying singing, which I have done since I was 12, I and tell my beloved Ellen Fall, uh, who I studied with for 20 years post college, uh, passed away at 90 years old about 12 years ago now, I believe. Uh, so I had been studying, and then I had my coach, Dean Williams, and I'd worked with these people for years and years. But the art of applying what they were asking of me as a singer, to me, is very different than as a teacher. They are two different arts. And one informs the other, certainly. All of those years of study informed my teaching. But the art of teaching, in my opinion, happens over a many years of having lots of different students to work with and understanding how to apply your knowledge to each student, both in their way that they learn, right? We have to take into account their learning styles yeah. and uh, how many, you know, how far do they want to go with different bits of information and what inspires them and what motivates them. So I think that craft is different and I think, again, I'm going to be answering a question that you probably are going to ask, so forgive me. You're good. But, um, you know, because I started so young as a teacher and then did that while I was singing, I've, I've probably taught 35, 37 hours a week for 37 years. So I've had a lot of guinea pigs. And, of course, as a young teacher, I taught middle school, high schoolers, and avocational um, and then that moved into collegiate undergrads and grads and then professionals and emerging professionals. And, and then, of course, as you know, I work on a medical team to rehabilitate injured singers. Um, and so it's given me a lot of guinea pigs to gather a lot of data to hopefully hone my craft as a voice teacher. Absolutely. So for those of you who didn't see it when I first put the book up, as we get into the book, this is Kari's brilliant, brilliant new book. If you've not get it, you should, and we'll tell you how as, as we go on here. You can get it on the Plural website, um, A Systematic Approach to Voice. So tell us, like, who your intended audience might be. You know, who, when you think of who the, the readers and who this book might be useful for, tell us a little about the audience of the book. Mm-hmm. So... Ideally, I, I originally kind of wrote it as a bit of a love letter to my students who, um, many of whom are teachers with full-time, very successful studios, and to my students who have studied with me for many, many years, who I knew would benefit from having what we've talked about in lessons in one place to understand how I kind of systematically approach each lesson with them. So it... it is originally for them and then teachers, of course, teachers of singing. But um, I, because I have a vast array of students, so I have some CCMers who probably never studied voice. Many of them came to me as injured singers and they get passionate about this stuff as well. And so it is for them, but I always say to them, listen, don't get stuck in the overview part of each chapter right? Just keep on moving through. If that's your first pass, that's not what's super important for you. It is important for my, the teachers of singing, but keep going and you'll find nuggets for you along each chapter. So it is written for singers as well that aren't teaching. And then the other big piece was writing it for an application course at the university. So I use Scott McCoy and also voice athlete um, and other lots of other resources and articles when I teach anatomy, physiology, acoustics, cognition of the voice it's first semester. But I wasn't aware of a book that really was geared towards second semester application. And so that's why I wrote it the way it did with the overview so that students can read that and go, oh, I remember reading that in more detail you know, in first semester. Oh, that's a good reminder. Great, great. Oh, here's the actual takeaways. And then here, when I'm having to do my lessons for my assignments, here's a bit of a roadmap with each system to approach the lesson, the application. 
Absolutely. And I'll just, as a public statement, I will say right now, I'm prepared to say this, that I will be adopting Kari's book as a uh -huh. textbook for my second semester PED course, um, undergrad you. and for grad practicum. So, I mean, thank um, you. I, this book has my stamp of approval already. Oh, I'm, I don't I'm, know how much that means, but <laughs> it means a um, lot to me. <laughs> uh, but um, so you, you mentioned it very briefly, but I think it's important to understand your perspective on this material. Um, in chapter two, you do give us a sort of an overview of evidence-based voice pedagogy that, you, that you've written about in the journal as well. Um, can you just give our attendees who maybe aren't, have not read that article, to tell us just a, a, a brief summary of, of how you came to that and what that is. Mm -hmm. Well, and Nick, you have been such a great advocate. I, I, I did a Vocal Fry podcast for those who are interested. Nick runs his Vocal Fry podcast, which is wonderful. And I was an honored guest on that to speak about what I call EBVP. Um, so a little bit of a repeat, but two years ago, right about now, I was preparing to speak at the Bernard Conference and several things came together in my life and I had this aha moment, probably a lot of it from Facebook, right? We see a lot of chatter on Facebook that leads us to ideas. <laughs> and I kept seeing evidence-based voice pedagogy. And I run a medical con or I, I run a conference here called the Northwest Voice Art and Science of the Performing Voice. And we had um, Dr. and SLP on a panel and they mentioned evidence-based practice and put the circles up on the screen. And I just had this epiphany that why aren't we in our field adapting that because evidence-based medicine adapted to evidence-based practice and it just made sense that we needed to have to follow suit with some concrete guidelines for what what does evidence-based voice pedagogy mean because when i saw it on social media i always thought it was the science aspect of voice it was the research aspect of voice i thought that's what evidence-based medicine was so I was shocked when those three circles came on the screen at this conference. I went, wait, it's not just about the science. They're also thinking about their patients and their own clinical experience. I thought, well, that's what we're all arguing about. We don't need to argue anymore. Let's, let's adapt it. And so I set about writing um, evidence EBVP and defining it and framing it with those three same components. Um, with very specific definitions and guidelines of what I felt were important. And in fact, I then, and you can find that article in Journal of Singing 2018, November. And then in anticipation for this conference, I asked my dear brilliant colleagues, uh, Lynn Maxfield, who helped me expand or expanded himself really the voice research component. Lynn Helding expanded the student goals and perspectives component, and Ken Bozeman expanded teacher expertise and experience component. And that presentation drops on Monday. People will be able to see that on Monday. Yeah, I would definitely, definitely encourage everybody to at, check that session out for sure. At the Nats conference. At, let's give, let's give at the Nats conference. Which is going on just now. That opening ceremony was fantastic. Yes, yes it was. Um, so just, you know, getting into some details now about the book. Um, if, our, if our, you know, viewers here are wondering, is the book, uh, you know, a lot of times when we've seen sort of methodology books, they've been maybe slanted more maybe toward classical singing. I'm thinking of Jim McKinney's book or, or toward, you know, contemporary singing. Um, it, it, it are both included in this or is it, is it one way or the other? Yeah, both are included. And um, that may feel challenging to some or over an overarching goal of mine. But um, I think that when we start from principles of voice production, and then layer the aesthetics on top of that, it, especially for younger teachers who are just coming into this, right? I think that there's a way in that, in, in that way you can enter in and then talk about the aesthetics. Now, that's not to say that somebody couldn't say, but wait a minute, I layer the aesthetics in while I'm teaching them to sing to begin with. So I'm not, I don't need to argue that point. Um, I think, 
both have valid approaches to them. But short answer, Nick, it is for everybody. Great. It really can be applied. And I have specific exercises that focus on um, a little bit more of the CCM component. I talk where the exercises that would be appropriate in the registration and resonance chapter would really be where you're going to find that information. I talk about lofted resonance versus brassy yeah. resonance and that um, hopefully teachers understand if they're teaching voice, they would understand how to do those, those fundamental changes. Sure. Uh, I'm going to steal a question from one of our attendees. I think okay. Brian Manternach is watching. So I'm going to steal one of his questions that he sent to Kari. Um, and I'm going to quote him here. There is a lot of emphasis in the book on embracing the process, in quotes, the process of singing, since, as you say, there is no point of arrival for the singing artist, rather an ever-evolving destination. Is a systematic approach, the title of the book, is a systematic approach to voice appropriate for singers of all skill levels and at any stage along their journey? Absolutely. It is for anybody. It's for, and it's for teachers who are just starting out and maybe even some advanced teachers might find a little nugget. But I, I think as a young singer, I was always looking for that one person to tell me the one answer that was going to make me a great singer, right? And you find that students teacher hop a little bit because they're looking for that teacher to help them find the golden, you know, ticket. And from Willy Wonka. From Willy Wonka. Sorry, there, I got a pop culture <laughs> reference in. Moving on. <laughs> um, and so what I always say to my students is in, buckle up and enjoy the journey because it is a journey of a lifetime. You can continue to grow as a singer throughout your life as I don't know about you, Nick, but I was in my late 30s, early 40s before, before I felt like, you know, when I open up my mouth, I can really count on what's going to come out. Um, as a classical singer, for sure, that sure. It takes longer to cultivate. And so I want students to just enjoy the process along the way. But so, yeah. this, so yes, yeah, so this book is for, for everybody. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so tell us a little bit, you know, the book sort of starts out with, in, in a way, two chapters of set up. Uh, at the very end, we have a chapter of... Um, sample warm-ups sort of or exercise sort of breakdowns but talk about sort of the 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 basic structure of your sort of core five chapters yeah. so the core five chapters as i mentioned earlier have the overview portion which um shockingly when it only turns out to be three pages of each chapter but that's what i spent so much of my time on because to read the resources that you need to to come up with a brief overview was more challenging than I would have thought to make sure it was absolutely fact-based as we know it in 2020, right? Check back in five years and we'll see what <laughs> came. Um, yeah. so, the, so the first of each chapter has a brief overview to hopefully spark interest and it's resource so people can to go read those other sources for more detail. And the second section is teacher takeaways which I kind of regret calling teacher takeaways for those singers who are reading it. They might think, well, this doesn't apply to me. I should have just called it takeaways perhaps, but there it is. And it's, you know, it hopefully answers some of the questions of why did I just spend a half hour reading about breath mechanics and the muscles and the antagonism and why is that relevant? So I tried to suss that out a little bit in the takeaways. And can I just say quickly about the takeaways before before you finish? Because it's yep. a good it's a good it's a good moment to just interject this. Your teacher take folks, you need to buy this book just for the teacher oh takeaways. Gosh. <laughs> and and I really say that very sincerely. Um, you know, the, the overviews are great. It's a nice you know, and, and she's going to tell you about the, the the application section here in a second. But but some of these teacher takeaway sections um, are my favorite, and I think that any teacher at any level could get great wisdom. Um, here's an example of, of a little quote from one of her, uh, wait, hold on. I just realized I put it in my, I put it, left it in the book and not in the, in the, uh, here we go. This is a lovely, lovely section. This is from her respiration chapter or breathing chapter. Um, and uh, this is a great nugget of wisdom. Since there are a variety of successful breath management strategies, 
Voice teachers must understand the biological mechanics of the respiratory system as it applies to singing, allow for individuality in the coordination of muscle activity, and have knowledge of the dynamic relationship between all the voice systems. It is necessary for teachers of singing to have a clear understanding of the mechanics of respiration and its impact on different genres in order to translate the information during studio application. And there's wisdom like that throughout the book. And it's just fantastic. So now finish telling them about the application section of the chapters. So, and so the crux of each chapter, thank you for that, Nick. The crux of each chapter are what, 15 to 20 exercises um, in, within respiration, phonation, registration, art, articulation, resonance. And uh, yeah, so hopefully those exercises will spur interest and one of my favorite things about the exercises is some of them are named for people that i've stolen them from you know really? uh-huh yeah they're called ode to so there's ode to joan later ode to my, my dear beloved ellen fall old ode to barbara dosher you know if they were because that one i found on john nix had posted on youtube some exercises of, yeah. of barbara dosher so i borrowed that and i wanted to credit um her so I think there's one chapter that has a, in these application sections, I think there's one chapter that really sort of is a unique contribution to our voice scholarship uh, that was very much, I think, needed and is going to fill a gap. And it will also allow me to eliminate a handout um, that I made oh. of my own that's not nearly as good as Kari's chapter. <laughs> and that's your section on SOVT exercises. Oh. So tell us about sort of, you know, why you included that, how you, the development of that section, a little bit about that. I, um, I, I hope it's okay to say, but I was most proud of that section, I think, because it was not in my original plan uh, in the book. And I, you know, when I came to phonation, I thought, what, what exercises are specifically phonation, right? Well, of course, you think of semi-occluded vocal tract that really gets at the heart of, of that chapter. Um, and so it just kept evolving and evolving and evolving, as you can imagine, um, because it, it's resourced in extensively because that is not my work. That is the work of many, many great people. So um, the SOVT section, I, I was really pleased with how it came together because again, it's one of those things where you see, you hear people online or in social media talk about straw phonation, um, and I felt there was a lot of misunderstanding, uh, even a lot of negative commentary about it, which shocks me because I am a huge SOVT proponent. Um, so, and then what I did is I, I really liked the part about where I talk about why to choose which SOVT, because yes. SOVT is more than just straw, right? Yes. And, and we have to discuss which straw size. And I really want people to think about straw size as being variable. On, on any given day, you might have to choose a different straw size. If you're coming off a cold and you're used to using the small two to three millimeter straw, you may need to upgrade to a drinking size straw because of how the instrument is healing at that time. Um, and so anyway, and, the, and then the water bubbles, I just, I am such a huge proponent of water bubbles with the 9 to 12 millimeter tube, the bigger tube. Yeah. Um, there's some interesting research about that. And even the uh, mask, the Floor anesthesia mask. mask. Yeah. Yeah, the anesthesia mask. I had just, I think Jan Potter Reed, I need to give her credit for that. She introduced me to that. And um, that's very interesting. People have a strong reaction to that. But anyway, even thinking of the SOVT options systematically, you know, when might you use NG? When might you use a larger straw? When might you use whatever? Exactly, exactly. Well, I think that, you know, I've been using my own just personally made handout, which is not nearly as detailed as yours. And so here's one ped teacher saying that one of the main reasons that I intend to incorporate this as a text, again, at least for second semester undergrad ped, and for graduate practicum is because of this SOVT section and the, and the systematic way that it is laid out. And not only that, and while we're just on that, there's two things I wanna to respond to that Kari brought up. One, this book, folks, is incredibly well cited. 
Mm -hmm. um, she does, she has gone to painstaking efforts to give people credit where that credit is due, whether that's the exercises, whether it's the science and the research, whatever it is, um, you know, as a, as a fellow author, that can be daunting. And she's done an excellent, excellent job of that. The other thing I want to say is the SOVT chapter is a great example of this, or the SOVT section of the phonation chapter, I should say, is a great example of the fact that the book lives up to its title. It lives up to the word systematic. And when you're a young teacher, I think that's such an important uh, knowledge base to have so that you're not just sort of throwing darts at a dartboard. All right. I know we wanted and, to get to this. And so, me, can I yeah, uh, please. interject for a second? Please. Um, I have to say I was, um, I thought a lot about, in fact, I have to give credit to Ken and Joanne Bozeman. I think they're the ones that, that helped me come up with the title. Eventually, I was, I was almost there. I think Joanne's the one that gave me the art part, um, which I'm forever grateful. And of course, I'm grateful to Ken, who was the first person that I let have eyes on it and just needed, you know, feedback. Um, and he was so supportive throughout the process, as were many, many people, you know, and I just, um, I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole, but this is so important me to acknowledge. Please. I, it, it's resourced and cited because I sit here having the honor of written this book, have dared to write this book only because of all the people from my first voice teacher in eighth grade, right? through studying and getting to know Ingo Tietze and Johann Senberg. And I mean, the list goes, if I start, I will never stop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, that is important. And I talk about that in the preface. I hope people will read the preface of the book because that is oh, definitely it is so important to me that people kind of read that and allow me to acknowledge and then the acknowledgments portion. Anyway, so all of that to lead us back to I was nervous about using the word systematic because as mm. I think it's the first sentence in my second chapter is this is not a method. I do not, I don't want anybody thinking that I want them to adhere to a method. I, I, I have a strong reaction to that word. Um, and you'll read about that in Brian's article for Classical Singer. I, I do not teach a method. I, um, but I, I use science informed information to gather an approach. So for me, the systematic is not that you have to follow my system to teach singing. It's that for centuries, if we, or decades, if we look at voice books, whether it be um, in, the, in the medical community, the science community, the teaching community, somewhere in each chapter, you'll see respiration, phonation, registration, articulation, resonance, right? And um, that is the systematic approach. And what I remember having from Scott's book that so resonated with me is that I realized that after really studying that book along with other resources as well, that I, and I think a lot of it comes from working with singers with injuries on the medical team. Yeah. I, they would sit in front of me and I'd have to think, all right, what, what of these systems I've really studied the mechanics of now, where is the issue perhaps? Knowing of course that it's never one thing. There are many roads that lead to Rome right? We could enter in, you and I could have a student in front of us, both hear the same thing, want the same thing. You might enter in knowing you from a resonance approach. <laughs> what? what? Me? No. <laughs> and I might, who knows where I would enter in. Kari has um, outed me. <laughs> so I, um, I realized that I was teaching, I was just diagnosing through the systems. Yeah. And so that is where that word comes from, not because this is a method. I love it. I love it. I want to get to Thank this you. word because <laughs> words, so words matter. Um, <laughs> you, have a, you have a phenomenal word in your book yes. um, in, the, in, the, in the respiration exercises yes. application so section. And the word is not flow phonation. You actually have the word flonate. F-L-O-W-N-A-T. I, I inherited from my father a wonderful, um, a, a sense of humor component where we can laugh. We really get tickled by our own funniness, 
right? So that was one of those moments. It's an ode to my father, really, Flonate. But again, not to be confused with the therapy called flow phonation. Yeah, exactly. So while we're on Flonate, yes. we're actually going to use that as a lovely transition um, to one of the best advantages about this book is that Kari's book comes not only with the book, but, and I'm just doing this for everyone because it took me a second to find it. But if you take the book <laughs> and you open the very first page, inside the very first page, there is a code for you to be able to access Plural's website, which has video demonstrations of every exercise in the book. And sometimes one of the most difficult things when you're reading a ped book and you're seeing different people talk about different exercises, because we all know as voice teachers, you know, you hear somebody talk about an exercise and if you've not actually heard it, sometimes you're like, wait, what, huh? Exactly. Um, so we're going to just do a moment of screen sharing. I love this. And we'll um, give credit to Daryl Jordan, Dr. Daryl Jordan, who is the guinea pig for this exercise. Okay, all right. So can everybody see my screen? Kari, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Okay, great, all right. So this is on the Plural website. Here is the compa you know, companion website. This is chapter three demos. And um, we're gonna go down here to the flow ball voiced flow nation exercise. This is to give you an example of what this is like, everybody. So not only can you read about all these great exercises, and of course there's one for every chapter, including the chapter that, that has all the different warm-up routines in them. And so I would really encourage you, you know, sometimes I think too often we get a book and then we don't actually look at all the multimedia. Maybe we find the multimedia overwhelming. In this book, because so much of this is just applicable exercises, I really want you to encourage you that once you go buy the book, because you should go buy Kari's wonderful book, um, <laughs> that you should then put in, create your plural account. You'll have to create a username and a password. I'm sure we all have 75,000 of those now. And, and you'll be able to have these exercises. Um, t t talk to us, you know, uh, uh, Kari, were the videos all your students? Yes, they are all my students, of course. And most of them, let's see, the pictures and the books are all University of Washington students. And most of the videos, but not all. And I think the funniest thing about the videos is that I had just luckily nearly finished right as COVID hit. And of course, Seattle and the University of Washington was the first to shut down in the country, March 10th, 12th, something like that. So um, we had to get a little bit creative with some of them and they don't all match, but yes, these are all either my UW students or my private studios students. It's, 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 an, it's a great um, inclusion. Um, for those of you who are you know, watching, um, we're getting close to the point where we'd like to hear from you if you have any questions. Um, that we've maybe not answered in the chat. We're not quite there yet, but if you'd like to start putting questions, I have my chat bubble open. Um, so if, if you if you have questions you'd like to ask Kari, um, this, this is a great time. Just pop over to your little chat bubble at the bottom of the screen and start tapping in some, some questions. Um, one of my favorite things, not in addition to the website, is that let's say that they don't have their computer or phone with them. I mean, like, right, somebody doesn't have their computer or their phone with them, but that the book does have these great, great visuals as well, either in the actual musical exercises or, of course, in, you know, if we're talking about some of these, uh, you know, more physical exercises, here's some of with the with the ball, has great images. And, um, you know, really, really clear, clear demonstrations. I mean, from the web, with the website, with the images and with what Kari has written, right. it's, go it, I, I promise it, it, it is worth the cost. So here's a question. Um, 
people can get the book both on Amazon and on Plural's website. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Amazon finally, uh, it, there was a lot of problems at the beginning because they were only ordering seven and they kept selling out and then they ordered 20. And so they have it now and it seems to be working smoothly. And then of course, Plural also has it. And Excellent. it's with the Nats conference, the code I believe is Nats 2020. Um, is there a discount code for plural? There is for the Nats conference people, yes. And um, Kristen will correct us if that's wrong, but I'm quite certain, yes, Nats 2020. Thank you, Kristen. Excellent. Perfect. So definitely go purchase this. We have a question in the chat. Um, is Car is Kari's, sorry, I almost read Carl. I was like, who's Carl? Is Kari's book appropriate for first semester students? Or is there another text she recommends as a preliminary precursor to your book? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, my book was not writ written for first semester. There are many wonderful books. And as I've already said numerous times, I, I personally chose Scott McCoy's book because of the way it's set up um, so succinctly covers really the very specifics of what you would want to teach uh, in a first semester course. Great. So if you, I guess if you were, you know, there's lots of different types of university pedagogy courses. So maybe if sure. you want to go that far in depth, maybe if you were teaching music ed majors or, you know, I, I guess there are times where it might work. Um, or maybe you're teaching a group class and you wanted to the hem to have a little bit of information about principles of voice mechanics, science informed information. You know, you just wanted to go a little bit, dip your toe into that and hopefully spark something and they would then go explore more. It could work for that. But if you're teaching, a, um, I don't know how, what the word is I would be looking for, but a first semester where you really are setting people up to go into a series, then I do not think my book is right for that. Sure. Um, uh uh, Kristen, maybe you can answer if plural publish it, uh, plural ships to Canada. Um, I'm not able to answer that one. Um, but I like uh, <laughs> uh, had a question uh, about your flow ball toy. Do you have a particular one that you recommend and, and yes. where people might get it? You have it yes. with you? Yes, I do. And I know there are others. I see somebody said in, in the chat, um, I just lost it, Toman. This is the one that Philippa Lobb, uh, I believe, developed called powerbreathe.com, powerbreathe. And it's, all, it's listed in my book. Um, and um, please don't kill me, Maria Russo. But where I tell everybody to go is just type voice foundation flow ball. And it takes you right to the order form. They ship more to the Seattle area, she said. I've just, in the last few years, bless their hearts, that office is inundated. So sorry, Maria. But that's where I tell people to get it. It's $9.99 or you can order, you get a discount if you order up several and want to give them to your students. So personally, this happens to be my favorite. You can buy cheaper ones from toy stores, but I like this one because it was developed by, by a singer for singers. And it that was one's... not designed to flonate. So let me, in fact, we should go back to that for a second. Please, please. Um, when I, the first time I picked it up and flonated, I was, I felt a little fatigue. I thought, I don't like that feeling. I'm not doing that. And I stopped immediately. And then I just used it for breath exercises unvoiced. And so I, one of my favorites is this, I call it the Oh goodness, messa di voce, the voiceless messa di voce. So you would go slowly up and then slowly down and it really helps you to feel that transverse oblique abdominal area. Um, so then slowly I did start to play with, and you have to decide with eat this ball, sorry, I picked the wrong ball. Um, you have to decide how far you want that particular singer to try and sustain it. And I have no science for that. So I will not give a, a specific answer, but I try and keep it about there when they're flonating through it, just enough to know that it's, it's um, elevating somewhat. And I love flonating. Um, I find it helps if you wanna teach a student a more legato phrase, if you kind of hear them doing stair steps on like a five note scale, 
Um, I find that they immediately have this epiphany. Um, my CCM men around the secondo passaggio, I find that they often, all of a sudden the sound will just change and you can hear the constriction. You can hear the timbre change. And so I'll just say, all right, pick up and phonate that phrase. And they feel the difference. They go back and sing the same phrase and suddenly there's all this freedom because the airflow has, as they've uh, gone up in pitch, they s seem to have more even airflow. So those are a couple things that I love about that. But yeah, voice foundation flow ball. <laughs> And one of the great things too, you know, about the book in that regard, you know, you might not be familiar with flow ball exercises. Um, Kari's done a great job of really sort of coming at vocal exercises really kind of from a holistic gestalt approach. I mean, there are exercises in the book that are just physical. There are exercises that are unsung. There are exercises that are sung that are that have specific musical patterns. There are exercises that don't have specific musical patterns. I mean, so there are, it's really very, um, you know, sort of uh, universal, I guess. That's a terrible word, probably. But it, it really runs the gamut of types of exercises. Um, we had a question in the chat about uh, if you did use Scott's book for which of Scott's books you used oh. in the first semester, Ped. Yeah, and I'm so sorry. I, um, somebody asked earlier, what's, what's the title of Scott's book? I, you know, you have that assumption that everybody knows Scott McCoy's book. Um, so he has two books. Um, it, the Basics. It, yeah, the basics, which just came out, gosh, two years ago. Five. But I, five, oh my God, no. Time wow. passes very rapidly. Wow. Um, so five, thank you for that correction. We've five. also lived five years in the last three months. Yes, that's so. true. It's all a blur. Uh, so that one is great for undergraduates, you know, and I was privileged to beta test that for him before it launched. And so, for instance, he had taken out something in articulation and I was like, no, 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 please put that back in. But things like secondary muscles and respiration aren't found in that, which is fine. He simplifies the four acoustic chapters in the more advanced version and simplifies it to two. So the basics is great for undergrads. And then yeah. the, the big boy book, is called Your Voice and Inside View 3. You want to get three because Lynn Helding's fabulous chapter on fabulous. cognition is in that book. And that just came out last September. And so, yeah. And you can get that at Inside View Press. He has many books now um, on, from his publishing company. Absolutely. Great question just came in. Uh, in my undergraduate vocal pedagogy classes, the majority of the students are future music educators primarily middle school and high school choir directors. Do you think that the systematic approach you write about transfers well to immature voices? Are there, or maybe even lifespan voice, I'm just adding that to myself, are there other resources you would recommend to pair with your text for teaching the, specifically the younger population, the developing voice? Um, great question, Daniel. I, yes, I think this book would work well for that, for that group of people. Um, and I would say, you know, as I was writing things, I kept thinking, you know, if you kept writing every, went down every rabbit hole you wanted to, the book would be, you know, this big. Um, so I, I tried to keep it streamlined enough that I think it would work well for that population of, of future educator, especially because of the application piece of the book. So I, I, I agree. Okay. I, and Very much. I'm so sorry. I'm not thinking of a pairing perhaps because I don't work a ton with um, like the super young anymore, but, and I would say, you know, as I was writing it, I often thought, well, isn't that self-evident? Isn't that, you know, it's like, you can't put everything in a book. If you're taking money to be a voice teacher, hopefully you can take this book and adapt it. That's the whole point is that I, I wanted to write it in a way that if you work with that teenager, you know how to take the concept of the exercises and adapt it. If you have a more advanced professional singer, you could take these exercises and adapt them um, to work for that population. And I, again, I work with, you know, 12 year olds to 70 year olds, and this is all applied with modifications to all that. I work with injured singers, I work with transgender singer, right? All of that, you just, you modify it for your particular population. But 
the essence of what I hope you need is, is there. I think that's so right. I mean, because, I mean, in the end, a larynx is a larynx. I mean, even though it's developing, um, right. you know, it, our larynxes are always developing. I mean, our, you know, we're all, none life. of our physiologies are ever the same, right? Uh, we, so, Brian, I, know. I saw that. does want a, uh, a little bit of an introduction of your co-author uh, of the book. And now we're is, now it's I, social media 2020. I should have brushed him, Brian. <laughs> Brian lo and has a little love for Oliver, um, who is my Nats Chat co-host as well. He's like, I was sound asleep, man. Let me go back. He's hard to see his cute little black head. There you go, Bubby. Say hi. <laughs> he um, he definitely was um, my co-author throughout and um, was by my side and. I thank goodness for him because I, it would get me out on walks and, you know, take a break and um, find my sanity again. Okay, you did your camera time, buddy. <laughs> he is thank you for that, adorable. Ryan. Kari and I are both dog lovers. So, uh, <laughs> my dog is, is not tame enough to have in the room here, um, but um, <laughs> we're glad hers can be. We did have another question that came through. Um, about sort of uh, training voice teachers for younger students. Um, do you have any recommendations of, of a resource maybe that, that, that somebody would uh, look for? Um, for younger students, like the under 10? Like, yeah, I think that's what elementary is what they're, you know, like a, a pedagogy for those kind of- You know, of, that's of, a of, great question. I will tell you that um, there are people that specialize in that and I am not even close to being one of them. Yeah. So I know Nikki Looney um, and she has her podcast series. Uh, yeah. I did a Natch chat with Shannon Coates where we really had talked about that with some fun ideas. I mean, really fabulous ideas for working with that age group. Uh, so those two women are where I would start. And then from them, you'll gather lots and lots of uh, resources. Dana. Yeah, Dana. Thank you. I knew there was someone else. Dana Lentini. Thank you, Cynthia Vaughn. Yes. And I was also going to mention Ginevra Williams. That's another and, name you know, um, yeah. that I would definitely uh, check out. Her book, actually. She has a book on training young singers and does reg does regular workshops um, and, and has a Vocal Fry episode about that as well. Uh, so keep questions coming in, folks. We've got still a few more minutes, and I, and I think I've nearly covered my list. Let me go back and check. And Nick, we could also just a take a moment. Um, the When we were talking about videos, I was reminded of Chapter 8. Yeah, so let's talk about Chapter 8 a little bit. That's a great yeah. idea. Thank you. It has eight vocal warm-ups, and again, these are not like in stone if you felt like the order could be different right this is just a guideline of um a how i kind of approach and there are they are for female and male voices and they are for ccm and classical and then they are set up by kind of level of of training skill um so like an avocational singer who's 50 might use the undergraduate teenage warm-up uh, for classical singers um, if we're in that genre. So, um, and then those, the entire warm-up protocol is on the website as well. And I think that that section, I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. Um, I think that section, again, going back to thinking about training young teachers in a pedagogy class from the um, perspective of like someone who's never taught a voice lesson before. Mm -hmm. Having those laid out exercises in order, even to use in a voice lesson to warm someone else up mm -hmm. is a very valuable resource. And again, of course, you might, as you said, you might vary it, you might change the order. So. I hope you do. Sure, yeah, <laughs> do your own experimentation, but you know, we, we, those of us who teach PED have observed our young teachers go into that first lesson with a real human in front of them and all of a sudden, you know, um, deer in headlights. And so that's, that's a really great resource. A, a question came in I want to get to. Um, does, do you have any advice um, for teachers interested in furthering voice habilitation and, and using your book? 
Uh, great question. And that is a huge conversation. It's big, yeah. Uh, so how do I answer that? I think my book, first of all, was not written. I know I'm a singing voice specialist, but my book was not written. Ironically, it is the same approach I use to my singers with injuries or pathology, right? It's the same systematic approach, much slower paced and diagnosing things more, you know, that are more difficult and differently in collaboration with the medical team. So I would say for those interested in, in the rehabilitation, the best, one of the best resources I can think of specifically for that is Lita Scarce's book, which is also yeah. thorough publishing. Um, and I am not going to think of the name. Oh gosh, Kristen will type it for us. But Lita Scarce at Plural Publishing, her book is a remarkable resource. Uh, but I would say that if you want to work with singers with injuries and pathologies, first of all, you need to have worked with non-disordered voices for at least 10 years, probably. And you have to do a lot of your own personal study. Um, you need to know fundamentals of non-disordered voices. And then most, most, most importantly, you must work in affiliation with a medical team. That is the, you cannot do that work without working with the team. So I'm agree. sorry, that was a little soapboxy answer to that wonderful person's question. But I think it was great. Okay. Uh, and, and Lita's book is Manual of Singing Voice Rehabilitation. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Kirk Kristen. Uh, uh, question came in about how, how long did it take you to finish the book? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kari and I have talked about this before, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Liz, I, I kind of, I originally started it, oh, let me back up really quickly. Brenda Smith was so kind to ask me five or six years ago now at a Voice Foundation Symposium. Um, and at the time, I was going to write a different book about vocal health. And then, ironically, one of my students um, who got her doctorate decided to write about transgender and talked about my systematic approach. And I thought, well, that's not going to make sense to people because I haven't written that book yet. Mm -hmm. So it kind of lit a fire under me. And I thought, well, I better get this uh, systematic approach, which I had already planned on writing started. So I started it probably fall. Um, I don't know what year are we in 2020. So probably fall of 2017, I actually started to write an article for something else. And I realized that that article with my systematic approach was really the intro to each one of my systematic chapters. And I thought, I need to not put that in an article. I need to just transfer this over. Um, and then the Venard thing interrupted that. Um, and yeah, so two years, let me just say two years um, at least. And that's on top of probably a 60 hour work week between teaching 30, five hours a week and all the other things so it was done on the weekends yeah i i everybody who knows me has heard this i had probably five days off in 18 months literally literally so it uh it was a good time <laughs> you're already being asked if you think there will be a second edition <laughs> Oh, Carolina, I love you. She's one of my students. And how, I can't believe you just typed that. <laughs> I'll deal with you in your next lesson. Perhaps, uh, perhaps the author might just want a week off. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years. I, the next book, there is a, another book that, that's not part two of this um, that I have in my little head. But um, we're not going there for a couple years. That's for sure. Uh, this has been a real labor of love, no doubt. I mean, I, I would imagine in a way, cause especially, you know, with what the conversation we've had today, you've sort of been writing this book in your mind for, you know, your whole career. A little bit. I, I mean, mean yeah, yeah, sort a, little of. Bit, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was, again, it was when you're young, you just sing and you sing how you're being told. And I, I wanted something more concrete. And I have to say, again, my beloved Ellen Fall, who was Juilliard Emeritus, um, and when she retired out to Camas, Washington, so I used to drive six hours every Friday for a, a one-hour voice lesson with her for, for a decade, and then longer even, but not every week. But for 10 years, I drove 
It was an eight hour day to go down for a one hour lesson with her. Um, and I mean, I, I just miss her so much. And I would love to, now that I have more science informed information, it, you know, in my head, I would love to have conversations because she was a pre-science teacher, but intuitively knew her stuff. And her- yeah, It's your model. It, it, yeah, and she did, she kind of taught me this idea of, well, how to practice, you know, with tools. She used the um, chopstick. Uh, what other tools would she have used back then? I'm sorry, candy, the candy that's in the book, that's Ellen Fall. In fact, I still use the same candy she used. It's magic. It's magic candy. Go, go lightly, butterscotch flavor. So, you know, I mean, I, I really attribute, even though she didn't live in a science-informed approach to teaching, there was, an assist, there was a systematic approach to her lessons and teaching me through tools how to take those and go home and practice and know that I would be doing something close to what I'd done in the lessons. So Absolutely. I, I really accredit her. And Nick, one last, before we Please. run out of time, I just, Please. I do a little, one further self promo thing. My mm -hmm. new oh, website yes. went live last night. Um, it, um, it's not quite complete and I'm, but I am pleased with where it's at. It's, um, the pictures were supposed to be new pictures, but once again, COVID has inter interfered with that. But um, anyway, the new website's out. And one of the focuses going forward for me is I think in our profession, we're missing the teacher practicum piece a little bit. And so I will be offering courses either where people can work with me one-on-one -on -one or in a group and, um, and help them to find their approach to how to teach voice that works for them. They don't have to adapt my methodology, right? But maybe I can help guide them in feeling more confident in how they diagnose vocal challenges and design corrective tasks for their students. So that's also featured on the new website. And super needed because I mean, as, as we talked about in, in Los Angeles at the summit, at the pedagogy summit, practicum is missing in a lot of our higher ed ped courses right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for bringing me back to that point. <laughs> We're nearly out of time. I just want to say for everybody, congratulations to you, Kari. May a systematic approach <laughs> be sold far and wide uh, because it is well deserved of of everything and its author is fantastic and go buy the book at the plural website using what was the nats discount code nats 2020 nats 2020 <laughs> plurals website go buy the book and go nats it. conference this next Friday. and we'll see you all all weekend yes go nats <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. I, I really, it means the world to me. You all are great. And we'll see you the rest of the weekend. Thank you.